kind of been built up. I, you know, he's kind of an aloof guy. I went in and met him, and I, I kind of, uh, when I was in the army, I said, gee, what, 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 would, what would be worse to go to fight Korea or go study under Sandy Meisner? Sandy, to me, was a teacher. He was the only teacher to me. I mean, I, and with all due respect to everybody else. And Meisner came in to, excuse me, Sandy, Mr. Meisner, God. not my father. He was nobody's father. He was your teacher. He was your mentor. He had standards. And you, you, you better cut it yeah. or you weren't back. But that was the reality of the world that you were preparing yourself for. And anybody who left the neighborhood playhouse left prepared to go to work the next day. Oh, I don't think I was ever comfortable. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it was uh, two years of stress and strain, almost unrelieved. Some moments were better than others. Once in a while, you would do an improvisation and get, get a slight nod of approval from Sandy, and that would be a, a red-letter day. And there were other days when it was disaster. Especially my generation of the 60s, who was a man who actually knew something? One of the first authentic people that I and most of us had ever met in our lives. And of course, he was autocratic about, about, about those things he believed in because he knew them to be the truth. Um, and we knew we were being exposed to the truth, but as to something which was absolutely practicable, and which absolutely worked, and which we wanted desperately to learn. I was talking to a young actress who went to the neighborhood playhouse. This is recently. And to hear her talk about Sandy, the kind of respect that she had for him and the excitement that she felt was what we felt uh, 20 or 30 years before. And I thought, isn't it marvelous? He's a man who has uh, had a laryngectomy and has had, he's gone through the tortures of the damned physically. And the spirit is indomitable. Um, and uh, that comes through very clearly. I mean, her, I loved it that she was still uh, apprehensive about, you know, she, I said, would you dare be late for a class? She said, oh, never. So here we are at the beginning. Why are you sitting here so silently? You're waiting for me to say something. Out of this world. In the first class that we had, Sandy asked, what, what do you think is the craft of acting? What is acting? And uh, it was the first class, the first day, and some poor schmuck raised his hand and started telling everything he learned in college about acting and went on and on and on. And Sandy listened for a few minutes and he finally went, shut up, you talk too much. <laughs> and. Uh, with a twinkle in his eye, I mean, he wasn't, but, he, but he, his point was made, you know, uh, that it wasn't a school for sort of working from here. And um, he said, um, the seed to the craft of acting is the reality of doing. It's the first thing he ever taught us. And from there, I was on a roller coaster of two years of, um, of his method. Listen for the sounds that come from the street. Let's, let's say the car, the number of cars you can hear coming from the street. Do that now. Let me ask you this. Did you listen as yourself, or were you playing some character? Did you do it 
in character, theatrically, or did you count? Yeah, me, I counted. You counted. Yeah. What about you? Uh, first, I was listening as a student, like mm -hmm. a the character, yes. And uh, then I was confused because I couldn't decipher, I couldn't hear a car, and the sounds were confusing. And then um, I heard what I thought, I'm pretty sure it was a car. And then I got bored, and then I heard another car. So I heard two cars. We won't discuss the boredom. <laughs> <laughs> so part of your acting was legitimate. Yeah. And two thirds of it was fake. Yes. What do you do when you teach acting, Sandy? I mean, is it possible to talk about? Like, what does an acting teacher do? What are you teaching? When I first began to teach, I taught with that kind of semi-intellectual manipulation, which one sees at its worst in the colleges, you see, and uh, rules, rules, intellectual theories, yes. you know, you can talk about how to play a part, but until it finds its living roots in you, it's, uh, it's in your head. It's what? It's in your head. In yes. your head. It's in your head, yes. And I am against the head. Yes. See? You have warm eyes. 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 That's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's an exercise designed to eliminate all intellectuality from the actor's instrument and to make him a spontaneous responder to where he is, what's happening to him, what's being done to him. Uh, in the beginning, there's an enormous amount of work and time devoted to getting rid of all kinds of prejudices uh, about what acting really is, so that the initial work is a sort of a, a process of, of, of getting the actor to really pay attention to the other person. Isn't that correct? Your hair is shining. Right. Your hair is shining. 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 We know you're making reading in order to create variety. You follow? Yeah. Don't. Okay. Do it again with, from another object. That process went on for a considerable length of time until we were truly able to, to surrender all the sort of uh, theatricalized behavior that we'd all practiced, you know, in summer stock or whatever it was that our varying backgrounds had, had uh, provided for us. Your earrings are small. Your earrings are it's small. empty. It's inhuman. Right. But it has something in it. It has connection. It's a connection which comes from listening to each other. But it has no human quality yet. Often, he said, uh, acting is like playing the violin. He says, it takes you 20 years. It, well, he used to say, it takes 20 years to be an actor. And somebody said, well, why, why? Why does it take 20 years? 
He said, because for the first 20 years, you have to think about it all the time. And finally, like playing the violin, you don't have to think anymore where you put your fingers on the, st on the bow, you know, I mean, on the strings there. You just know where. She said, it's going to take you 20 years to become an actor. And I thought, how dare he? I played Lilium in college. <laughs> I, I, I'm an actor already. And it isn't until the 20 years elapses that you realize what he's saying and why he's saying it. Well, aren't you supposed to be an actor now, darling? <laughs> well, the 20 years have gone by. But what I'm saying is, what Meisner was able to do diagnostically is what's so brilliant about him. He takes you down to a certain level and then slowly with these exercises builds you up to a confidence so that you are a craftsman. One nice thing about dealing with people from the Playhouse is that they've been they've been trained viscerally, ineluctably, to put their attention on something other than themselves so that it's a lot easier to work with them. When you have to cut through the various layers of self-consciousness, which come down to protectiveness, most actors being badly trained are terrified of being foolish, of looking foolish, of, of, of doing something which is out of their control. I mean, but you have to if you're going to be any good. Your value as an actor depends not on you, but on what your partner does to you. And for that, you have to be wide open and receptive. Don't agree with me. Do it. In around 1924, something like that, the Moscow Art Theater came to America for the first time. It simply astonished everyone with the, uh, with the perfection of their acting and the depth, the depth of their bench, so to speak. Everybody was good, and they had four famous great actors, and all the rest were wonderful, too. And the smallest parts were played by wonderful actors, and everything was worked out so well, whereas we were used to things being done perhaps in a more shoddy way, but also the fact is the American theater wasn't really mature then, and most of our plays were very shoddy plays. We didn't really have first-rate, world-class theater till Eugene O'Neill came along sometime later. In any case, all the American actors went and were astonished. And some people immediately declared themselves disciples of Stanislavski. When all of these people saw that there was a man who approached this in a very scientific way, and said acting is, has to do with reproducing honest and truthful human behavior in imaginary circumstances. And there's a way we can break this down into moments and into attitudes. That's the sort of major breakthrough that I think w was made in the 20s and 30s in this country, or beginning to be made, when, when people began to take Stanislavski and, and make it American. The group theater was formed in 1930 at the beginning of the Depression. Its leaders, directors, Harold Clerman and Lee Strasberg, and producer Cheryl Crawford created an American acting ensemble based on the Moscow Art Theater, using Stanislavski's work as a guide. Meisner was a founding member. This group of actors, directors, writers, and designers sought to do plays that would mirror the life of their time. One of the actors, Clifford Odets, became the group's most important playwright. For a decade, until 1940, the group theater included in its ranks such gifted people as Stella Adler, her brother Luther, Francho Tone, Lee J. Cobb, and Elia Kazan, who was then an actor. It's an example of something that's very rare, devotion, artistic devotion. There isn't anything like it. We don't have it today. Uh, a, a group of people, 30 people, who are devoted to the same idea and uh, work together. And uh, what was remarkable was uh, how we uh, it became the central thing in our lives for years, and that doesn't happen in this society. And against the tide, always, always against the tide, we were always bucking things. I don't think it could have happened except in a, in a depressed, economically depressed era. Sandy was, uh, I remember him all through the uh, group. He was a uh, most sensitive, urbane, and uh, gentle, fine man, and a uh, man of... Uh, 
unusual and delicate sensibilities, but always, uh, always an artist. And then when the group broke up, everybody went their way, but uh, Sandy stayed, his way was to stay in New York at the uh, Neighborhood Playhouse and continue to teach, uh, teach acting there. He was a very young man then. He was, I think, 32. He was an uh, extremely emotional man, uh, given to, uh, to uh, blowing up. Uh, I, I used to do an imitation of him saying, don't argue with me! Uh, he couldn't stand it if you argued with him, and it was stupid to argue with him. But it, it was a different story then, because he was a, a very busy actor. I remember he was teaching a class. He came to teach class at 9 in the morning, the night after an opening night. And he, he played several roles on Broadway in the time I was the playhouse, two years. And yet he was at class every morning. He was a dedicated man, but he, he drove himself so that it was understandable that if, it, if a student annoyed him, he, uh, he would blow up, and he did. I think at the beginning, people teach teach what they've learned. So I started that way. I taught the way I learned from the group theater. But then I began to develop and my own values, standards, and ways of getting at them, which are the exercises. Hey, answer me. Hey, answer you. Yeah, answer me. Hey, answer you. Yeah, answer me. Is that a stupid question? Is that a stupid question? A stupid remark? A stupid remark? Yeah, is that a stupid remark? You're looking at me like I'm stupid. You are stupid. No, I'm not stupid. You're not stupid? No, I'm not stupid. You're not stupid. No, I'm not. You're not stupid. No, I'm not. Would you just blank out? I always try to feel in my, in my acting that I want to boil things down to behavior. I think it's the beginning and the end of acting for me is behavior. And I think the way Sandy uh, wanted people to improvise to set it up for them to learn how to do that was to talk, listen, listen, talk just like we're doing now, not knowing what's coming next, and just taking from the moment. Are you stumped? Yeah, I'm stumped. You're stumped? Yeah, I'm stumped. You're stumped. You're stumped. Well, I have to tell you something? Would you have to tell me something? He gave us a certain kind of basic way to do an improvisation, which was based on a repeat exercise, which is his foundation exercise. And finally came down to not doing anything unless one had to do it. So that in the work, when something happens, it happens because it has to happen, not because someone wants to make it happen, because a director wants to make it happen, or an actor thinks they want to manipulate, but because it's set up so that it has to occur. So that you have your own world, which finally becomes a cocoon. I found it very safe. I guess that's a terrible way to talk about acting, but it's the only way it appeals to me. I don't really like being in front of an audience. And to know my world, what I am, who I am, was a cocoon. It was my protection. And Sandy supplied that. After my operation, I couldn't utter a sound. I was in Beckley, where I lived. I used to go to a beach there and practice every day. I was determined to speak. I practiced assiduously. I don't know any reason why I shouldn't speak the way I used to. Speaking is different. Well, sure, he, he's had his larynx removed. He's had a car, a terrible car accident, and. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't seem as though it's really slowed him down. I mean, he's still 
goes to Beckley. <laughs> he's still, um, the last time I saw him was at a performance of Look Back in Anger. My husband was doing Jimmy Porter and Look Back in Anger in New York. And um, he was just as wonderful and funny and terrifying as ever. <laughs> he's, he's just an old lion, I think. I saw the photographs, but the quite well-known painter that he had passed by this, I don't know, in his arms, and they strapped brushes on his hands so that he was able to paint when by all common sense he should have quit. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm sort of related to that unquenchable impulse to teach. I don't speak well. I don't see well. I'm deficient in all the 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 avenues of communication, except my vision. I say, don't act. Don't fake. Don't pretend. And don't anticipate that she's going to knock at the door. Now that will train your concentration, your active faith. And it may be your emotion. Then you can say you're learning how to act. Then I can say I'm teaching you. Now, let's have it. Hello, Joe. Have you seen Father? Yeah. He's down here in the garden. What Sandy did is begin to examine the fact that dialogue is the last thing that happens any time between two people. It's all supported by behavior and attitudes. You say something, you, you mean a certain thing to me when I see you because of whatever relationship we may have. You say something, I hear it, Depending on the state I'm in when I come into the room, it means something to me. It produces a reaction in me emotionally. And the last thing that happens is I respond with dialogue in some way. You better snap out of this beach club lightheadedness of yours, because we've run up against something desperately serious, you and I. The text is like the libretto of an opera. You read the text. You have to make the music, and the music is emotional. For God's sake, Jock, you've got to see this plane. The only thing that means anything to him, it's like an obsession. You're wrong. You're fantastically wrong. Oh, yeah? And why does he take on so about you getting married? You ever think maybe he wants to marry him himself? Just shut up! Hey, Gladly. from the point of view about simple reality. That is the kind of reality which you get just from allowing your instincts to play truthfully for you. You follow? It was very good.
but it didn't go any further than that. Now, what I mean by that, I have yet to show you. It needs a certain emotional deepening. You follow? I think the thing that made Sandy a good teacher, first, first of all, is his own disciplines as an actor. Um, he loves acting himself personally, loves the, the taste of it, you know, just the taste of acting, putting together a role. If you see his work, it's layered and it has a, has a wonderful concentration and a, and a deftness and, and he, he loves the art of things. Sit back, ma'am. I have no desire to frighten you. I know how to sit, Mr. Stanley. Why do you smile, ma'am? Would you really like to know? I ask the questions here. Why? Because you're purring like a pussycat, but you'd really like to knock my head off. <laughs> Is it not a fact, Mrs. Brown? It seems as if he's improvising. It seems as if this strange creature just came to life that moment before the film, before the camera, and is, is living out this uh, this intense existence, and that that is that is exactly what he wanted acting to be and what he tried to get us to do. Did you not continue seeing Mr. Ellis after you turned down his proposals? Yes. And he, on his side, kept seeing you. Yes, I kept seeing him as a friend. Oh, you kept seeing him once or twice a week as a friend? Yes. Did Ellis and your husband ever meet before that night? No. You thought you could keep them apart? They would never meet? Yes. Yet you unlocked the back door that night and let Ellis in. Yeah, but I asked him not to come. You don't want him there? No. You don't want him in your home. You know it's dynamite. Well, it he was there. Did you have to unlock I the think door? that Sandy really did want to be an actor. And I think that the delicacy of his, of his feelings were not reflected in the way he looked. I mean, I think that, that, that Sandy's quality as an actor was an extremely poetic quality. But what was he going to be cast as? Uh, and I think that that, I think that that Personally, I think that injured him, mm. and I think that he, to a degree, turned his back on acting, and uh, there are many of us that have to be extremely grateful that this, that this happened. The most obvious market for something like this would be, would be professional. For years, many of Sandy's former students thought that his work ought to be recorded, that his teaching should be videotaped. I got involved in the project. I was I was asked to to do it because I'd spent so much time as Sandy's assistant, and I'd been privy to eight years of very constant and intense work with him. Offer to all of the colleges which have theater departments and have film departments a really first rate acting course. What happened is that we organized classes. Uh, Joe Papp was very generous and gave us a room down at the at his theater downtown. We uh, organized over a two-year period during the summer time, uh, one week of two sessions a day, one session in the morning, a lunch break, and then one session in the afternoon. I did them with uh, two cameras running constantly, and, and we've filmed some 70-some hours of, of these classes. Know. You know. I know. You know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The school is yeah. structured on a two-year basis. The first year primarily focuses on, on stripping away old and bad habits that one may have come there with. We are one. I think so. Out. It's defensive rather than offensive. That is, it's a way of, of, of weeding out any false behavior. I'm not quite sure I want to answer that. Come on, I'm not asking for their names. The second year essentially is to take that instinct which which you one hopes is now honed down rather sharply and now actively set an objective task for it so one begins then to learn character work and uh, all kinds of uh, heightened ways of dealing with emotion okay start reading this okay so the actor's rostrum is a thing of the past Barbara why'd you chase them away like that I'm tired Sam Maury's my friend. Her too. You jealous? No, I'm not jealous of anything. Okay, we can talk about this. This is coming out of nothing. Right. Right. Now, what are the circumstances that is 
seed. This seed. What kind of a life do you think? We have nothing. We have absolutely nothing. You have nothing? No. You're Just... pregnant? Yeah. Who pays for the food? I do. Have you ever uh, found yourself in a position of being so upset inside that if you could, you'd jump out of the window? <laughs> well, very few people have, but acting is imagination. Now, before you can open your mouth, you have to have a full preparation. Not when you prepare, turn your back on her. And prepare. They, we got to a place in the method that's called emotional preparation, which is your way of becoming emotional for a scene. Uh, if you have to cry or if you have to laugh or whatever you have to feel or, uh, for a scene, it's a way of preparing for that. And when that happened, suddenly I had the bull by the horns because I had for years been, you know, my mother was always opening the bathroom door and I would be in there sobbing my guts out. And she said, well, what's the matter with you? And I was embarrassed to tell her that I was acting by myself in the bathroom, that it was just, I had gone into these kind of fantasies that would make me cry or laugh or whatever. And uh, they all thought I was a little bonkers, but suddenly what had been crazy in Arkansas made sense in New York at the Neighborhood Playhouse. Now stay that way and begin. Give me a few more months to try to get in the play. Oh, so it'll be two years and seven months that you've tried. Oh, Barbara, it's all I ask for you. Then, then will you promise? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go to bed then. We're both kind of tired. That's the same. To say. It used to say, you know, it's like text exists. They're like a like an unpainted house right. in a way, or an unpainted board. It can be red, it can be green, it can be blue, it can be yellow. Where do you get the paint from? Uh -huh. where, where do you get the colors to soak the text in? You get the colors from asking certain questions. Mm -hmm. what, who, what is my life with him like? Doesn't mean anything unless it's miserable, he's a, but his friends are bums, he's his friends are bums. It was a rather extraordinary experience to come back after 23 years, 22 years, uh, because there was this sense of, of coming back to something and understanding it very, very clearly after taking it away and practicing it in a practical sense. All right, all, all the film cameras go into the second positions that we ended up on Friday. Remember those positions? If I have any kind of technique at all as a, as a film director, which is a long way from acting for the theater in Meisner's classes, it's all based on what I learned from Sandy. It's all based on those concepts. There's a spine to it yes. that you've got to find, yes. and then you'll find the moments. Don't yes. work on the moments. Okay. Yeah. It's too early to work on the moments. What is the intention of the speech? The intention of the speech is, I'll tell you something about the world. I'll tell you how sad and tragic it is. What That's Sandy taught you so clearly is that the basic thing about character is how you do what you do. You know, it's, it's not so much what you do, but how you do it. And what you begin to see is that there are thousands of ways of doing the text. And what is required is a point of view a real sense of who you are and what you are doing. Um, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between a 
an action and an emotion. I mean, a lot of what we've been doing is, for instance, your stand up. Show a little respect. Now, I'm gonna tell you something. Did you do what I told you to? Yes. Did it do something to you? Yes. That's the difference between doing something and what it induces in you emotionally. Acting is doing and meaningful. Acting is doing under emotional circumstances. You understand? Imaginary that? or emotional? I mean, I've always heard imaginary circumstances. Now I'm hearing emotional. It's all imaginary. It's all imaginary. You think Hamlet is real? <laughs> You no. follow? Yeah. My that considerable experience in psychoanalysis. Did I tell you that? No. And I do know quite clearly that the death of my brother when I was five he was three, was absolutely the dominant emotional influence in my life, yes. which I have never, after all these years, escaped when I went to school. After school, any time I lived in a state of isolation, as if I was some kind of moral leper, because my parents were good people, but not too bright, told me. That if it hadn't been for me, they wouldn't have had to go to the country where my younger brother got ill, out of which illness he died. So the guilt that that caused was quite horrendous. I very rarely had any friends. I lived as I'm afraid I still do in a world of fantasy. Not at all. 
Not at all. The only time that I'm free and enjoying myself is what I'm teaching. The secret of the stars, gravitation. The secret of the earth, layers of rock. The secret of the soil, to receive seed. The secret of the seed, the germ. The secret of man, the sower. The secret of woman, the soil. My secret? under a mound that you shall never find. The worst possible thing that I can say to you is that it's got to be made interesting. And in order to do that, it means in its simplest way to find a way of doing it, right? Yeah. Now, if you were teasing me, you know, and say, you know where I live, it's a building, and it's red brick. But I'll never tell you what my phone number is. Play with me. Tell me, you know, play with okay. me. The secret of the stars, gravitation. Get my suspense. I'll try to think it out with you. The secret of... The secret of the stars... Gravitation, the secret of the earth, layers of rock. Francis, yes. wait, because what I do, ah. you forgot that. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. See, yeah. I will not do. Okay. <laughs> The secret of the stars. Gravitation. <laughs> the secret of the earth. Layers of rock. The secret of the soil. To receive seed. The secret of the sea. The germ. <laughs> the secret of man. The sower. The secret of woman. <laughs> the soil. My secret? Under a mound that you shall never find. <laughs> now, let's examine what we did. It's because it was more interesting. You know, yeah. what made it more interesting? Everything. <laughs> no, specifically. Having a specific uh, intention, a teasing, an attitude made it more A way of doing it. A way of doing it, it. yeah. Right. Right. Be specific. It's all over the neighborhood plans on the wall. The 
say, wasn't that the difference, Francis, between what you and I did? Absolutely. In fact, when you, if you have felt the experience of the specific uh, emotion, mm -hmm. and then you try to do something and you haven't got it, you really do feel so empty. You just don't know quite what is wrong, but there's something not there. Mm -hmm. It's a terribly depressing kind of mm -hmm. nothing. And you keep wondering what's the matter. But as soon as you did, I mean, I didn't know what to do with that little piece that I did. And as soon as you gave me that specific, it was so easy, relatively. Easy, easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Easy and fun. It doesn't seem to matter even whether what you're called upon to do is supposed to be harsh or sad or depressing or whatever. It, when you know what you're doing acting-wise, it's then fun. Mm -hmm. You know something? Acting. It's fun. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't let that get around. <laughs> He made you want to act. He made you enjoy acting. And I think when you're young, you're looking for people to look up to. And you run into a lot of people that make you the other way. And not excited. Not cynical. It's all nonsense. There's too much pretend, there's too much nonsense, pretension. So <clears throat> he was very important to, for me in terms of my enthusiasm. I think of all the people that I directed, I think uh, his were the best taught in a way that I liked best. They were both uh, sensitive inside and they were f free as far as their uh, external behavior went. And, they weren't, uh, sometimes you got actors that didn't taught the, the uh, so-called method, which is a term I hate. But uh, they were <clears throat> as if they were playing scenes with themselves. But with Sandy, they, they, they had this inner life, but they were not inhibited externally. they're doing, what they're doing seems to be being done with a kind of, I don't, it's, it's like the energy is contained and it's harnessed and it's, and it's specifically pointed onto what the moment is. Ten hours later, hand it back. You're telling me he has to be watched? He has to be nursed and guarded and coddled, but not Please. by me. There ain't nothing you don't learn that later on in life you might need it. And when that day comes, well, you can thank your lucky star that your good friend Boone helped you. What he wanted from you was truthful acting. And he was able to communicate. And the proof of that is the number of people that have come out of there over a 40-year period who have gone on to become people who set standards of acting themselves and changed the, a great deal about American acting. He is the brainer of the sunshine and rain. He is the force. There's no way to get him out of your mind. You know? Whenever I work on a scene, uh, I find that uh, he, he wanders through my uh, unconscious and often into my conscious mind. You know, I think of things he's taught me, things, ways, that I might get into the scene ways I might understand it better. He sets a tone. It's, a, it's, a, it's constant, his presence in my life, as a standard bearer. Sandy is, wants to give, but I don't find there's a show-offy thing that I find in so many other teachers. 
look, I'll show you how much I know about acting and how dumb you are and what a, what a wizard I am. I never felt that about Danny. I felt that he was truly interested uh, in the progress and helping an actor find his way uh, of getting to a part. And if it deviated from Sandy's a little bit, that was all right, too. As long as the actor made some progress towards allowing his talent to function. It's a play. An acting teacher is God to the student. There, there is a tremendous tendency on the part of a lot of the more recent acting teachers to use their God position to uh, tie people to them, to cripple them almost, so that they're afraid to take a step without the approval of uh, the teacher. Sandy set you free like a good parent. He'd say, go out in the world and, and do it. It's tough out there. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't say, you can't do it without me. Even my job at the law school, I can honestly say I earned. What a teacher! Two years ago when I married you, you were going to do such wonders with the laws had never been heard of. You had the most beautiful violence about it. Oh, glad for money, then. You're a strange case, Francis Battle. <laughs> Good, I like it. First of all, I'll tell you. You were all young. In fact, sometimes the material is beyond you. Sometimes I see it. It's put quite within your scope. Most of it was. See, and when that happens, you execute it quite well. See, it's when the emotional problems are deeper than you are yet prepared to realize behavior-wise, that's when you were, uh, in a way, are deficient, see? But that's not important, you know, because time will fix that. It's very easy to give advice. So, I'm going to tell you something that's impossible. Keep working all the time. See, do all kinds of plays, whether they're right for you or not right for you, because eventually time and you will catch up with each other. You follow? And your basis, which is, is solid, hold on to that. I'll see you one of these days. 